All right, there we go. So um, the images are the ones in the uh, the, the thumbnail. So um, basically, it's a very similar process for these uh, these five images. And if you want to have a good look at them, dead, you know, check them on the website or on Instagram as well. But basically, the idea is, um, you know, a human face and uh, some nice, cool sims going on in there. Um, so I'm just going to go through some of the tools that I've used. Uh, like I said, I'd, I, I, we were talking before the stream, obviously, and I said it would be nice if I could um, do a full one, but it's going to take too long. So I'm going to show you all the tools that I've used and that's sort of the workflow of bringing them together. And um, it all starts with a human. And the cool thing is there's a, a Blender add-on, and that's something that's really fun about Blender as well. A lot of the add-ons uh, tend to be free. So I'll see if I can... Show it real quick. So I'll show the website real quick for people. So uh, this is dude called Manuel Bastioni. Um, he worked on Make Human as well, if I'm correct. I'm not 100% sure, but he provides a um, free plugin for Blender uh, to, cre to create human-based meshes. So they're fully rigged and stuff, which is absolutely amazing. So I can choose whatever. I'm just going to leave it to the default um, Caucasian female. I can hit init character. And I forgot to turn off some of this stuff. So I'm going to do real quick. Uh, I can use cycles materials, but I'm going to throw out the studio lights. So that immediately gives me uh, a character. So that makes things really easy. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, in the Cinema 4D community and Adobe community, there's a lot of people that use the Adobe ones, if I'm correct. Adobe has something built into Creative Cloud with like animatable characters and stuff. Um, and this is basically the free sort of blendery version of that, I guess. Um, so let's see. Yeah, you can change different types and things. Um, I'm not going to go through this because this is something you can have a look at home, but I'm just going to finalize it and. Uh, see, I don't want to save the images, I just want to finalize this. So that's the first thing I do, is just make sure I have a mesh. Ah, yeah, somebody saying Mixamo, that's uh, that's what I meant. I think that's one of the, the more commonly used ones. All right, so she's done, almost. There we go. So now I actually have a fully rigged character um, that I can use really easily. So that's really cool. Um, so I'll do some work to this uh, to get it ready for the simulation. So in Blender, um, I use the Blender particle system. And um, yeah, yeah, and this is pretty funny, but it's actually just a bone um, and not a nipple. So. <laughs> um, so I use the Blender particle system, and it has fluid particles built in. Uh, so you can do some cool stuff with it. And um, I know from experience that I'm going to have to scale this up. So generally what I'll do, just to be really quick, is grab this mesh and um, make sure it's somewhat smooth and just export it as an OBJ just so I can re-import it. If I want to re-edit it and try stuff, then I still have the old version to fall back on. So I'm just going to throw that in there and make sure apply modifiers and I don't want anything else. And then I can leave that model and the rig in here, so that way I can change it afterwards if I need to. And the reason I sometimes do this is sometimes you just want the mesh, and if I want to try and collapse that mesh down uh, with the rigging and everything on it, I have to remove some stuff and make sure it works, and now I just have a really easy mesh to work with. So scale this up, maybe even more, and just edit it and throw away everything I don't need. There we go. I think I might have overdone it a little bit on the vertices, but we'll see. And then very quickly, just fill up the bottom edge. Uh, let's see if we can do this easily. Select my trait, and I believe it's non-manifold, yeah. So that will give me all the uh, edges that are um, sort of open. 
So that means I can very easily deselect all the ones I don't need up here. There we go. And I just fill that up. Very simple, but it works and it does what it needs to do. So again, I'm going to try and get this done as quickly as possible. But basically I go in and I delete everything I don't need again. So it's always really important with simulations that you use uh, as little as possible when it comes to stuff that you need and don't need. So actually I'm going to do this differently. Sorry, I'm getting a little messed up here. Yeah, I definitely divided them too much. It's a bit slow. There we go, and now I can just hit plus. Go back a bit, maybe even a little bit more. Throw out the faces. And that way now when I go back in, I can select this internal eyeball, delete it, and I'm just left with this little shell, but that's still useful for the simulation. So when I'm simulating inside of these faces, I want to make sure everything's closed off. So generally um, with the mouth as well, I'll, uh, I'll model it. I'll just make sure that it's closed off here as well. So you get one nice closed mesh so that when the simulation happens, you can actually look at um, how it works. And I'm not going to use this model for simulating because it's going to take too long. I just want to show you the approach and I'll uh, open some of the, the final files from the other ones so you can see exactly um, how that worked out. Uh, so let's see. What am I doing here? I'm in the middle of somewhere. Looks like I got a little lost here. See what I'm doing. There we go. Looks like my camera got all messed up. But anyway, um, I'm just going to show you on a basic sphere how the particle system works and then uh, some of the cool things you can do with it. So, like most other 3D applications, um, you have a base particle system and then you can use forces to affect it. So, let's smooth this out. A very simple object to start with. And um, when I just hit play, everything's incredibly slow, probably because I still have these enabled. So I'm going to disable my modifiers here. There we go. And um, I'm just going to make this a little bit clearer as well. So I'm going to display velocity and up the draw size. So this is just a very simple particle system. Um, again, I don't think this looks too foreign if you've worked with anything else that has particles. But the cool thing is uh, they have fluids built in. So I'm going to set my end frame a little bit higher and set it to 25 frames and then set it up here. So as some of you might notice, I've done this quite a number of times because I have some somewhat default values. but. Um, some things that I know just work a little bit better than, uh, than the default settings. So now I have a whole bunch of particles, but I don't really want them to um, do anything uh, except for being affected by the forces. So by default, they use the normals of the image, uh, uh, not of the image of the mesh as velocity. So now if I spawn them, nothing really happens. They just stay there. So now I can start adding in force fields and um, like any good visual effects artist will tell you, don't just add one turbulence force field, always add more than one. So you get two different variations of noise within the same scene. And that always breaks up your simulation and makes it look, look, look a little bit more interesting. So I have two separate ones now and they're doing their thing. I can tweak them in just a minute, but the first thing I want to do is add a whole lot of particles. So let's go straight up to 250,000 and see how that affects everything. So you can already see this is giving me really interesting, uh, interesting looks, but it's a bit too quick and it's breaking up a little bit too quick. So this is where a good understanding of all the different uh, facets of simulation comes in. So one of the things I want to do is 
pull down the drag, or up the drag rather. So this way the particles just have a little bit of drag applied to them and then they, uh, they make some more natural feeling things, um, natural feeling, I guess, shapes and stuff, and you can keep them together a little bit. Um, then the second thing I need to do is still set them to fluid. So right now they're just regular uh, Newtonian particles, so they just use usual uh, regular physics and they don't interact with each other, they just use the forces in the scene. But once you'll see, uh, once I switch this to fluid, not only are they going to explode, and uh, there's a good reason for that, but they're going to make more interesting shapes. So one of the reasons they're exploding right now is uh, they're too big. So there's an internal size for each particle, which Blender is using to interpolate between the different particles and give the fluid effect. So I'm going to turn this down um, to something I know generally works. So down here in the size, you can change the size of the particles, and now you'll see they start behaving a little bit more normal. Now you still can get some weirdness, um, but that basically has to do with the fact that I'm spawning too many particles for the particular surface. So because there's too many, there's uh, particles spawning in the same place, so there's like this little collision going on and you get a few of them to freak out. So you can do either one of two things, either um, bring down the size a little bit more or just turn down the number of particles. So in my case, I think if I go from 250 to 200,000, that should work. So we're getting a little bit more stable and you're always going to have some, uh, some stuff in the beginning. And again, you can tweak this until it's perfect. So it's just a case of um, tweaking as always. So I still have my two noise values here and I haven't changed anything. So I'm going to start messing with them now. The first one, I want a bigger one, which is a little bit stronger. And I'm going to change the size up to like two to something. And the way uh, to look at it here in Blender is if we look at the grid, um, I don't know how visible it will be in the stream. Maybe it's more visible here. I have kind of a dark theme going on. So let's see if I can switch that. Uh, and this is a little bit more default. I don't know if that's much better. This is the default Blender theme. So let's go uh, default. So hopefully it's a little bit more visible on the stream. Um, but basically, each one of these squares is one by one. So you can imagine if my particle, uh, my turbulence field size is two, I can get um, sort of swirls that are about the size of these two, um, these two units or these two uh, grid units. So that's a good way of referencing it. And if I turn off the other one completely, we'll see. Oh, not negative, but. If I turn it off completely, you'll see that sort of happens uh, once everything starts sticking together a little bit further in the simulation. You get those sort of bigger breakups. Now, one of the other things that uh, I haven't changed yet is I want to bring up some of this stuff. I want to mess with the way the fluid actually behaves. And um, I've noticed that bringing up the mass slows them down a little bit, but keeps them together a little bit better, which is really nice. So that way you get something that feels a little bit more natural and you get less of this um, kind of crap, I guess, <laughs> flying all over the place. And you can see the effect the force already has on the fluid. So and some other stuff I like to play around with, uh, the stiffness and the viscosity are really important. So if I bring the stiffness down, the um, you'll get sort of more intricate shapes, interesting shapes. And then if I bring the viscosity up a little bit, the fluid will move even slower. And I've noticed to get the results that I get for the faces, I usually, I'm usually simulating like 500 frames, 750 frames, and in extreme cases with a lot of particles, even uh, 1,000 frames, because I just want to get those forces to move around a little bit and, and mess with them. So, if you look at it now, you can see there's already a really big difference in how it behaves than before. And we get these really interesting and, and fun results. And, you know, playing with simulations is fun because you just get to, like, I always feel like I'm sitting at this giant console and, or like a cockpit and I'm just twiddling things and seeing what effect they have. And um, that's really nice. So generally, I'll set up a few of these emitters within a face but I'll show you the same workflow uh, just within a cube so you can see what's going on. Actually, something like this. And, or maybe even a little bit smaller just for the sake of gravity. And I can set up a collision. So, I mean, when you're looking at Blender uh, and even if you're a Cinema 4D person, you can see a lot of this stuff is very similar to, uh, to Cinema 4D. So uh, setting up this collision will, will allow it to uh, collide, the particles to collide with the shape, 
And then, for example, I'll set the draw type to bounds so that way I can look through it at all times and uh, I can see the effect of the particles a little bit better. So with that going, um, I can mess with this as well. And this is something I really like about Blender a number of years back. They tried to make everything as um, interactive as possible. So you can play with these forces while you're simulating and see the effect on them before you do your final sim. So I set this one back to zero. So I'm going to pull it back up to like maybe 1.5. And you can see it moves a little bit quicker. And it might be interesting to bring the size up. So I want, you always want like a big noise to, to create the overall shape and then you want a smaller noise to sort of break it up a little bit. And depending on the shape that you want, you can mess with it. Now, another really cool thing um, to do is these forces and uh, that's something interesting about Blender in general. A lot of these things, while they seem static, the fact that this force is over on this side and this force is over on this side actually affects the um, way the forces are being used and spread out. So if I want to get even more variation, what I can do now is animate these helpers to the forces. So the force itself is going to turn into a Star Wars podcast. But so the force of the, the object itself is actually changing as well. So that gives you even more dynamic motion within the fluid simulation. And um, this is sort of where, you know, my After Effects stuff meets, meets other things. Um, it's very easy to set drivers in Blender. So for example, if I just want this to move up during the simulation, I can type hashtag and the hashtag will uh, start something which is called a driver in Blender, which is a bit like um, an expression in After Effects. So if I type hashtag frame, um, it's just gonna get the current frame number and I'm gonna divide it by like 100. So if we're at frame, what is it, 260 or 270 something, you can see it's 2.73 and now it animates automatically. And now this will actually affect it as well. And I can do something similar for, let's say, the rotation. And I'm glossing over this stuff, um, but I just want to show people more uh, what it can do and, and how I do things rather than be very particular about one thing. So I'm going to change that box, make it a little bit smaller just so you can see the interaction. Go. Just let it run for a little bit. And as you can see, the, the shape of the simulation keeps changing because of that. You can see sort of the forces pushing it and pulling it around as they move around. And I find that stuff really to be really fascinating myself. So <laughs> that's why I like working with it. And here we can see some of the first particles um, hitting the, the side and bouncing off and doing cool stuff. So. Um, you know, if you're in a pinch or on a budget and you want to learn some stuff and try some stuff, Blender is, is a great option because a lot of the tools that you'll find in other applications are in here. All right, so that's looking pretty cool. Maybe I want to give it a little bit more um, so we have something to work with. I'm going to add that little touch of um, initial velocity from the, from the sphere as well. Set to like 0.25, so that way the particles they push out a little bit and they're gonna move out to the edges a little bit quicker, and we can see that collision with the box happening a little bit better. And just let it run. And the Blender particle system scales quite well with the number of cores in your computer as well. So that's good to know. Um, if you have a really beefy CPU machine, then uh, that's, that's a lot of fun to use. All right, so let's let this run for a little bit and uh, then get into actually shading and doing other stuff. See if there's any more questions or anything. Okay. Okay, so let's work with this. Um, we can work with that. We can shade it uh, and the uh, 
the workflow, I guess, will be exactly the same as with the faces, but it'll be a little bit quicker because it's slightly less particles and uh, and it's just a box. So um, yeah, the faces got pretty pretty crazy towards the end uh, when I was doing like millions of particles. It got a bit slow. So um, so the next thing I'm going to do is something very simple. Uh, I'm just going to create a simple plane, and I'm just going to go into vertex mode and I'm going to collapse it all down. So I just want a single vertex. So um, you can't really see it because it's just a single vertex, but there's a cool uh, cool thing in Blender. So the way things work uh, in Cinema 4D, you work with hierarchies, for example. So you'll put something into a cloner object, if I remember correctly, it's been a while, and then you'll put it into an array and then you know all those things work together. Blender has similar tools, but they use a modifier stack. So basically each uh, object can have different uh, modifiers on them and there's a whole bunch you can use. Now for this one specifically, I use the particle instance and what it does, it will map that mesh to each um, particle of your particle simulation. And I'm using a single vertex uh, for a reason that will become clear pretty quickly. But what I can do is I can grab the round cube and immediately you'll see it'll grab all the particles that are in that simulation but it allows me to apply that. And now I have a single object with um, 200,000 vertices, which is a lot lighter than any type of simulation or anything else. And you can use this as a base to build on. Um, so what I can do now is grab another like sphere and usually I'll do it with a cube um, and then subdivide it at render time just to try and keep things as light as possible in the viewport. So I'll scale this down a little bit and then I select the cube first and select the uh, vert uh, the point cloud, I guess you could use it. It's not technically a point cloud, but it's just a vertex cloud. And then parent them together. And um, there's a really cool little feature here uh, that's called dupliverts or duplication. And you can duplicate these over um, these vertices. So now I can duplicate this cube over all these different vertices, which is really, really cool. So. Let's see, and this is where it does tend to get a little bit slow. So I'm gonna scale down the cubes, but not I'm scaling down the object instead. So I'm just gonna turn this off a little bit. And this is just one of those things that's gonna be slow anyway, because you have to keep in mind, um, even though this cube only has six vertices, there's 200,000 um, 200, points in this mesh. So it's going to be 1.2 million uh, vertices all of a sudden, or 1.2 million faces. So it can get a little bogged down. But luckily, um, even though the viewport preview gets a little slow, the render stays extremely fast because they're uh, GPU instance, which is nice. So if we turn this on real quick, then this is going to look OK. I think once I, uh, once I start subdividing them down, no, actually, I'm not going to scale them. It should work just fine. So I'm just going to turn them off for now and uh, get into the second part of this, which is the actual mesh, the human mesh that I use, uh, that I sort of mess up and, and decimate in interesting ways. And um, sort of that works together. You get this weird wireframe, and then um, it helps to sort of keep the shape and keep the recognition a little bit. But um, it encapsulates a lot of the uh, techniques that I use. So we'll do the same thing with the cube. And uh, it shows you a bit of the workflow that I use for that kind of thing. So we use a lot of different modifiers and I'll go pretty quickly, but um, if you have any questions in the future or whatever, um, like a lot of this is on my YouTube channel, so check it out. And, uh, and I'm always happy to, to help when I can. So um, first thing I'm gonna do is subdivide this a whole bunch of times, maybe like, I don't know, 31 times, so we have 32 subdivisions on each end, and then I should have done this before. I'm just going to undo it. First, I'm going to split all these edges. So that means um, each one of these polygons is actually not stuck to the other ones. It's just separate, and the reason I do that will become clear in just a second. Now I'm going to subdivide them. We go. And as some of you might have, note, might have noticed, Blender is extremely keyboard focused and based. So um, if you don't like keyboard shortcuts, then you're going to have a bad time. <laughs> Let's 
See, so now uh, this for the people that follow me and are here, they, they're probably laughing at this point. I use displace modifiers for everything. So this allows you to use a texture to display stuff. I mean, obviously it's in pretty much every 3D application. This is a, uh, the crux of a lot of my workflows. So here we go. And then I can assign what kind of texture I want. I'm just going to use a distorted noise, uh, the cell noise pattern. Pump up the size. This is going to give me a really kind of messed up mesh, but um, the way I'm I'm doing this stuff, uh, the uh, is sort of I have an end goal in mind, and I'm using this mesh as a volume rather than a properly topologized mesh because the next step uh, is basically remeshing. And um, this is really cool because I can remesh in a number of different ways. Either you can do a sharp mesh, approxi uh, mesh approximation, smooth, or it can do blocks. So if you want to voxelize or pixelize something really easily, then this is going to be like your best friend. So I can choose the size and I can even scale it up and down. But um, basically what this is going to do, it's going to give me this mesh that um, is wholly subdivided and, uh, you know, I can I have these straight lines now that I can do things with, and it depends on the, the um, image I put in. So even if I change this, it's going to affect it, and like that's probably a really bad example. But you'll see, you'll get slightly more organic shapes once you start messing with the more organic noises. Um, but I use, like to use this cell noise thing a lot because it works really well for like technical sort of looking patterns. So with that mesh in mind, um, one of the things I want to do is I want to create wireframes from this because who doesn't love a good wireframe, right? And um, I want to take away some parts of the mesh. So first thing that I need to do is get rid of all these subdivisions um, because if I wireframe this, uh, I'm going to save this very quickly just in case. But ooh, here we go. Come on. Yeah, so in, uh, fun fact, if you simulate particles in Blender, you've got two options. Either you can simulate them to files on your disk, or you can simulate them to RAM. But that means they'll also be included in the Blender file. So this Blend file is probably going to be like half a gig or something because all the particles are in there. So let's give it a second. See how big it is. Yeah, so I'm already at a gigabyte now. There we go. So what I'm quickly going to do is because I've simmed and I don't need these simulation caches anymore, I'm just going to throw them out because uh, it'll allow me to save the file a little bit quicker. It's down to uh, 25 megabytes now, so it's a little bit better. So let's get back to this mesh. So um, again, as we would with other applications, you can keep throwing stuff on, but I like that this is procedural. So decimation, usually you use it just to decimate a mesh. But again, there's, a, there's different kinds of decimation, and one of these is planar decimation. So what this will do is it will actually grab uh, all the planar parts of my mesh, and then um, it basically removes all the excess geometry and just keeps the, uh, the angles, which is really nice um, because then you get a more sort of clean mesh to start with. Um, so it still looks the same, but it's a little bit more optimized. There's less faces, and it's going to be easier to start taking stuff away. Then um, the next step is a little, a little abstract, but um, I'm just going to run through it. So there's a thing in uh, Blender called vertex weights, and basically, um, I think it's in most 3D applications. And I remember similar things being 3ds Max back in the day. But basically, you can assign different weights to part to different vertices of your mesh. But um, this little trick allows you to use a texture to do that. So I'm using textures again and again and again. Um, I love procedural textures. They make things really easy. Um, but it also makes that if you want to change stuff or make variations, you can try things really, really quickly. So I'm just going to make an empty vertex group. And I'm going to populate that with a, um, with a texture. So I'm going to add it in. And I have a tutorial exactly on this stuff. So if you want to know more about it, go check that out because otherwise it's going to take me too long to explain. But basically what this allows me to do is have a second texture in here and make the second one a little bit bigger. And then um, a lot of modifiers in here have a, uh, have a little vertex group um, which you can use. And then I can use this mask that I created to only have it affect uh, 
parts of the parts of the mesh. So it'll become clear in just a second. So this mask is just going to delete polygons, um, and because there's no vertex group, it's going to delete all of them. But because I put that texture in, now all of a sudden, I should be getting it. I forgot to put in the vertex group here. Now all of a sudden, I get really interesting looking things because I'm using this second texture, and I can change it, for example. Um, to mess with the geometry. And this is where it starts getting really fun because the setup only takes a couple minutes, but now I can really start playing with it and seeing my end results in real time. And that's uh, one, of the, one of the reasons I really love this workflow. So with that done, we can throw on a wireframe. There we go. And now um, it's starting to look a little bit more like what I was doing before. But again, even if I just want to take away from this mesh, uh, what I can do is I can mess with the contrast, for example. So I'll put a little bit more black in the texture, and it will start taking away more and more from the mesh, maybe even bring the brightness down, and um, there we go. Now it's just to a bare minimum. And when you start rendering stuff, it's always sort of finding the right, uh, yeah, I guess the right balance between the two. So I'm trying to go over this as quickly as I can. Uh, I'm trying to think if I'm forgetting something. No, I'm just going to set this up in the wire flame. It just gives them a little bit cleaner. Um, allows them to be a little bit cleaner. And again, even if this is too busy and I want less wires, I can always go back to my remesh a couple of steps back, change the octree depth so the, the sizes are a little bit bigger, and uh, I'll get slightly bigger wireframes as well. So it's all about linking stuff together and, and keeping it working. And, you know, it's fascinating. It works really well. There we go, something like this maybe. So let's try and light and shade this and, uh, and talk a little bit about cycles and, and how Blender works for that kind of thing. So um, one of the reasons I really love it is because I can just switch to rendered view. So you can just have a rendered viewport running. And obviously, to anybody using Octane or Redshift or something like that in Cinema 4D, this isn't new. But when I was coming from 3ds Max, this was kind of kind of cool a couple of years back. So I'm going to switch over to my node editor. So you can do materials in here. But I personally prefer nodes um, just because I'm more used to it, and I think it's a little bit more more flexible. So first thing I'm going to do is I have to set up lighting before I start messing with materials. I've just put on a basic one here. But um, let's see. Um, I'm just going to add a light, and I'm just going to add a sun lamp, and it's a bit of a hack. But I found these to work really well with particles because you get a very nice um, sort of parallel lighting. And with a lot of tiny particles layered on top of each other, you can get really nice playing uh, of the shadows and, and the light, especially with a single point um, with single point lighting. If I just set it to render now, you'll see the wireframes already lighting up. And I want to turn off my, uh, my world, so my environment. So this is where you put in HDRIs and stuff as well, just to get the lighting. So now that I have just the lighting, I'm going to have to start turning on uh, the, the dupliverts here. And unfortunately, it's going to get a little bit slow. So um, I don't know if I'll be able to do it real time. Um, but yeah, this is the way it is, I guess. Let's see if I render this. Yeah, it's not too bad. Let me make sure. That I'm only using the that I'm not using the display GPU, otherwise things will get a little bit slow. There we go. All right. So let's play with some. Let's mess with it a little bit. You can already see you're getting a lot more uh, dynamic sort of looking things. So just to be quick, I'm going to turn these off in the viewport, and we're just going to keep it to um, to renders. Uh, that way, I can iterate it a little more quickly, and I can answer some questions while while I'm rendering as well. So I'm going to add a camera to the scene, and have my viewport here match it. I'm just going to go for a square, uh, basic square thing. And this is something I find really, really interesting. Um, when you see a lot of things on the internet, people tend to not mess with their camera a lot. And focal length is, 
the you know one of the most if not the most important um part of your uh of your toolkit when you're doing camera work if it doesn't matter if it's real or not uh in real life or on a computer your focal length really changes the way things look so if you want like a very sort of static um looking thing and you want it to look a little bit larger you can increase the focal length which um generally people you know when you think about focal length, most people just think about zooming in or out, but it actually affects the way your image looks quite a lot. So you can test this really simply. You can make a cube in Blender, Cinema 4D, whatever you use, and then create a camera, and then uh, have, let's say, the cube fill about half of the area of your render, and then go from one end of the spectrum of focal length, so really low ones like 18, or you know, if you want to go fisheye, even 10, 12, something like that, to super zoomed in stuff like two, three, 500 millimeters. And um, try to keep that cube the same size in your viewport, and you'll see that the higher you go up in focal length, the more your lines will start, the image flattens a little bit, and that really makes a huge, huge difference to what, what I'm straightening out a little bit image looks like. So for this one, for example, and I'll, I'll try and show you uh, practically. So if you do a lot of these motion, graph motion graphics, tech techie type of things, then I found that longer lenses, so more zoomed in uh, focal lengths, tend to work a little bit better for this type of this type of thing. So let's run a very quick render and see, uh, see how quickly this does it. So this is at 85 millimeters, and if I'm going to do the same thing now, uh, just to prove my point at something extreme, like 18 millimeters, I'm not only going to have to zoom in, but you'll see how everything gets distorted. Um, and whenever I'm explaining this in a classroom, is uh, 50 millimeters is called, you know, they somewhat look as a standard. It's cl close to what we see as human beings. Anything above that is uh, a telefocus, uh, a uh, Hello. Wow, I can't think of the word. Anyway, is um, more zoomed in, and anything smaller than that is wider, or is a wide-angle lens, uh, which is commonly referred to. So if you look at the difference, it's exactly the same scene, but just having a different camera and different focal length makes a huge difference. So this feels really weird and awkward. Also, I didn't frame it perfectly, so there's that. But just um, the way this looks, it feels very unfocused. There's the, the lines are going all over the place and it doesn't feel quite correct. And then when you look at something with a longer lens, now all of a sudden this feels a lot bigger, it feels a lot sturdier. Um, it's got a lot more weight to it for some reason. So think about that stuff. Uh, um, yeah, just think about that stuff in the future when you're doing these things. It, camera work is really, really important. So I'm just gonna go back to my focal length here. And um, let's see what else we can do. So um, we can't see the particles in this one because I've turned them off. I've only turned them on at render time. But I am going to change it to a principled shader. So the uh, principled shader in Blender is basically like um, any other shader in most other applications. It's got all the different things. It's a PBR shader. Uh, and it works quite well. So I'm just going to keep this very, very simple, but I just want to show you very quickly the workflow that I usually do. Bring the sun up a little bit. And then get into showing you some, some compositing afterwards as well. Um, so I think I need to move my camera just a little bit as well. Something like this maybe. And let's see if we can introduce some depth of field, because everybody loves that. So. so another little trick, um, when I'm focusing on stuff in 3D, rather than going for like the very closest point, um, it can be interesting to put your focus a little bit further down. So if I'm looking through the camera here, rather than having you know the thing that's really close, let's see. I really overdo this just to get an idea. I'm just gonna up my uh, environment here so I can see what the, uh, the focus is doing. So it's getting a little, little mucky, a little gray. Maybe just increase the uh, wireframes a little bit. 
and again, it's a, it's always a back and forth. You know, you're trying different stuff, trying to do, trying to get things to work. So you can see the depth of field hard at work. And we'll do a final render real quick to see it in context. Oh, forgot to change my environment. So I'm going to do that first. Turn it back off. See, I can see some questions. So somebody asks, is Dupliver more lightweight than the particle instance modifier? Um, it's more flexible. Uh, I think the particle instance modifier does a good job, but I don't know. I just prefer having that mesh with points that I can then start because I can displace that and start doing stuff to that as well without having to deal with all the. Um, what you call it, all the uh, geometry of the dupliverts. So that's kind of why why I use those. Um, so so uh, is there a page with a different expression syntax for the driver? There is one somewhere, but I'd have to look for it myself. But then I know um, I can show you guys this maybe really quickly. I have a Chrome window open. Let's see if I can find the right tutorial here. Tutorials, Blender, Variations. Oh, wrong window. So this is one I refer to quite a bit. Um, it's a tutorial in Vimeo. So I don't know how visible the link is, but people can pause it. If they... It talks about how to make marbles in Blender using drivers and having each one of them variate. And he talks a little bit about creating your own custom um, like functions and stuff that you can use. So that's really cool. It's a really good video. Uh, so if you want to get started with them, I would look into that. So our render is done in the meantime, and um, it's nothing special, but it'll do the job for now. one more re-render and then uh, show you my compositing process a little bit. There we go. Usually I'll mess a little bit more with uh, lighting and stuff, but it's again, it's just sort of more an introduction on, on how to do it. And um, maybe, you know, some people to have a look at Blender and, and see how that works. So. So the cool thing is, I'm back in my node editor, and this is my uh, my uh, thingy from previously, my material. Wow, it's getting really warm in here. Um, so I can switch over to my node editor, and this is something that uh, I was talking about earlier that I really like. Now I'm compositing that same image. So I didn't have to move over to After Effects. I didn't have to change anything. I just in Blender, and I can just keep going. So um, this works like any other node-based uh, compositor. So I can add in. You know some curves, for example. So I can start bringing this up and messing with the colors and things like that. Um, but yeah, I'm not going to get into this too much, but it's just to show you that I do stuff in here as well. And uh, I'll open some of the final files now so you can get an idea of, uh, of how they worked. And if I've missed anything, I can get it from there. So I throw them in here somewhere. I have to find the right version and see which one can I open. I think this, uh, those two, so three and four would be the most interesting. All right, so this was split up into two windows. Can I go back? There we are. So this is the uh, the final file, and uh, let's see if I can turn off the dots here because they're what's making this so slow. There we go. Um, so this is uh, this is the setup for the particles. So again, um, same idea. It's just multiple ones, and uh, I doubt it'll run because I've turned them off, and I don't know how well um, they're going to run. So we'll leave them off. But again, uh, just to run through it. Same thing uh, with the drag and, and the different settings in here. 
I messed with the different settings within the fluid to get some more interesting shapes. Then uh, same deal here. I cache them out and um, just have a mesh full of points. And again, it's really slow, but you know, that's what you get for trying stuff. We have a few questions from the community. I think okay. uh, uh, I will um, tell them. So um, someone is asking what kind of commercial work you do with a Blender. Okay. Do, do you have um, examples? Because I, I see on your website it, it's uh, mostly uh, personal projects. Personal work. Yeah. yeah, that's that's, um, that's a very uh, driven choice on my end. Um, one of the reasons for that was that I wasn't happy with the type of commercial work that I was doing a few years ago. It, it was a bit, you know, boring is the wrong word, but it's not the most exciting content, I guess. Um, it's good work and it's interesting, but. Uh, nowadays, though, the result of that is that I do a lot of work for visuals. So I'm finishing up a really big project, for example, for a nightclub in China that needed a whole bunch of visuals, and that's through a company in, uh, in the Netherlands. So they found me through Instagram and saw my work, and, uh, and they wanted me to be part of the team. So I worked together with three other people uh, on creating visuals for the club. So that's really cool. Um, I've done a number of work, uh, visuals for DJs, I've done album covers, I've done um, all kinds of things really. And there's still uh, a number of jobs that I do for local studios here in Antwerp that are still a little bit more corporate. So they're generally more meant for internal usage or at like a convention or something like that. So it's a mix of both. It's On the one hand, I have the really exciting, cool stuff that I do with musicians and DJs and, and, and bands and all that stuff. And on the other hand, there's the more sort of, you know, the, the more steady jobs, I guess you would call them. And um, like recently I was doing one for a bicycle helmet. So I, had to, I got a CAD model from a bicycle helmet and then my job, um, because they have people that are okay with 3D, but I'm a little bit more specialized. So some of the harder things I end up doing and I'll help in the concept phase as well, trying to get ideas out. So, so it's a bit of both, um, honestly, but uh, most of the time it's that kind of thing and um, some visual effects work. I recently did something where I had to um, add an extra block of apartment buildings to the cathedral here in Antwerp. It was like an April Fool's video for a big, um, yeah, big like housing development company. So it's very varied actually, but I do it almost all exclusively with Blender. The only, um, can, is my screen still visible or? Uh, actually, uh, I was uh, on your website, but uh, I can... Okay, no worries, it's fine, I don't, uh, I don't necessarily have to show it. The only application I probably use the most outside of Blender is called Caden Live, which is an open source video editor. So Blender is also able to edit videos. It can do so many things, it's crazy, but um, but it's it's not the easiest one to work with. And I found Caden Live to be closer to Premiere. Um, which is what I'm, I'm used to, so I, I made the switch to that. So if I'm editing, I'm usually using Kitten Live, but for pretty much everything else, I'm using Blender uh, for all the commercial work as well. But I don't post it as much because I want, yeah, I want my personal work to be the things that get clients interested because they'll be more inclined to ask for things which are more my style um, that I've created. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm currently on the Blender website um, and uh, in, under the Fitter uh, tab and uh, yeah, it looks uh, very po powerful. Um, it is, yeah, I, think I think the last few years have been very, very good for, for Blender um, and there's a new version coming out which they're working on, which they're working on really hard right now. Um, which is going to have like, you know, the built-in uh, real-time viewport and stuff and it's really incredible to be able to use every new feature the moment they implement it. So you can also download daily builds, which are experimental and they might not always work perfectly, but I've used them sometimes in production if I need certain things. Um, generally, it's when cycles get certain improvements that I, I try to use the daily builds. And um, like recently, something that isn't in this version yet, but will be in the next version that I've been testing is adaptive sampling, which has been put into a number of renders at this point. And like, especially with the kind of thing I've been doing lately, a lot of reflections and things. Um, you know, sometimes 
it's like a, a quarter, uh, three quarters of the render time, or even half of the render time in certain scenes, and and it's gone even crazier on some other ones. So, it's really cool to be able to look at that stuff and instantly try it out and see if it's valuable or not. Um, and that's something I really like about it. Yeah, and I saw some features that looks uh, exciting, like the. Um displacement modifier uh, looks really more powerful than the C41. Actually, C4D have a lot of... Uh, he's late because they are uh, re rewriting their core for six years, mm -hmm. so a lot of things are not on point. Well, every 3D application has its strengths and weaknesses, though. I mean, <laughs> but um, no, the, the displacement in cycles right now in, in Blender 2.79 is experimental and it works, but it's not super optimized. But in the new version, vector displacement works and the previewing in the viewport works a lot quicker as well and, and it's better optimized. And um, yeah, it's cool. Like, there's not a lot of features that I miss from having um, worked with like super proprietary stuff for a long time. Like I've, I've worked with Creative Cloud and like Photoshop After Effects, that kind of thing for, for it's weird switch, God knows how long. But with Blender, definitely it's one of the few applications where I don't feel like I'm missing that much at all. Um, you know, everything works pretty well that's in there. And you know, even the fluid particles and things, which I abuse to do crazy things with. It's all in there, so it's fun that to have a really diverse toolkit. Yeah, so maybe you want to show a few more things uh, on your Blender? Sure. Tell me when the, the screen is, is still active. Yeah, we are back to yeah. the screen. Okay, cool. So I'll go, go back to this one real quick. And um, if we look at the... Uh, is it still up here? Yeah, so if you look at this one, you can see there's sort of an additional pattern going on within the fluid sim. And that's one of the reasons I, uh, yeah, I don't know how visible it's going to be, but it's one of the reasons I um, convert this over to like a, a vertex cloud because it allows me to add modifiers on top of that again as well. And I can redo the whole process and, and add even more stuff. So here you'll see if I exaggerate it. There's actually a displace modifier on it, which, ooh, <laughs> that's too much. Let's see if I can get it to look sort of interesting. There you go. So now I can start displacing these even further. Uh, and if I were to render this, then I can get really interesting looking, uh, looking things. And um, I think that's about it. Uh, we'll open the other one as well, because there was something about that one that I wanted to show. Again, for the same technique. Now these always take a while to open. And again, you see similar things, but um, this mesh, for example, has got really crazy weird topology. And you can see, once you get going with these modifiers, there's so many on them. So it might be interesting to just solo this out and then uh, show you how it's built up from, from start to finish. So I'm just going to turn off all the modifiers and then activate them one by one and give a little bit of a, a explanation as well. So first thing is just uh, subsurf, which is same deal as you know any subdivision thing or hypernerves. Is it still called hypernerves in Cinema 4D? I remember it being called that, but Anyway, um, and then I'm doing the same thing here that I was doing before, where basically I'm assigning uh, two of these vertex groups. I'm putting vertices in those groups with textures. Uh, so I'm just going to keep those closed, and then I can use those in different ways. So first thing I'm going to do is mask it out. So again, you get the same thing that I was doing before. Um, and again, it's uh, driven by these two textures. This is the first one and this is the second one. So if I would change this one, for example, to like 1.5, then you'll see the size actually change. It should. <laughs> Maybe it's the wrong one. Ah, there we go. There we go. So you can see the, the sizes change um, just by masking it out. Then I'm going to decimate that. So again, the decimation can be done within a mask, so I can use different parts of the mesh to be decimated, so you get more interesting uh, 
interesting workflows going. So you get sort of a, a polygon look and then sort of a decimated look uh, running through each other. Decimated even more because, you know, good topology is a motion designer's enemy, <laughs> especially when you're trying to do weird things. Um, and again, I'm always thinking in function of the final form. I know I want this to be a wireframe. I want it to have interesting lines and intricate, intra, intricate looking patterns. So, and then I'm going to smooth it out. So smooth is just like any other smooth operator. It'll just relax it or smooth it depending on, on the 3D application. And you can do this in separate axes and things. And this is why I like this because I can just hit buttons and a lot of really cool project and, and ideas have come from wanting to try a new tool or looking at a modifier and being like, hey, I've never really seen and You start clicking on them and things start happening and ideas sort of start popping up around that, uh, which is a very fun way to work. Then I'm going to wireframe this, but uh, this, this already looks really cool further and smooth it out. And if you smooth out a wireframe, you get these really cool organic looking things. And then uh, I decided to wireframe that again. So now, um, if I just turn this back off, because I've pushed these out, I get really crazy looking edges. And a lot of this is about breaking the rules of topology as well. And then um, there we go, wireframe it again. And at the very end, I'll uh, add in a subsurf modifier, which I'm not enabling in the viewport because it's going to bog everything down, but it's just going to smooth out these lines. and. Even in the wireframe modifier, for example, I have control over how much it's going to smooth out all these different points and angles. But um, basically, yeah, that's uh, that's it. And it's a really fun and interesting way to uh, to combine things and, and get creative. So I think that's pretty much it for these. Um, yeah, if people are interested, now is the time to ask a couple more questions. I think, and we should be. Uh, be pretty good after that, unless you uh, have some other th stuff in mind still. Maybe, sure. maybe you can go back uh, with your face. Um, I, I have the mic disabled uh, on um, OBS. That's why uh, I asked a second time. <laughs> oh, okay, no problem. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's fine. I'll uh, we can we can finish up. So, question time. Wow, it's incredibly warm in here at this point. So, my apologies. No, no question at the moment. <laughs> no, no questions. questions. Oh, <laughs> that's, that's a really, really good thing. thing. A really, really bad, bad thing. thing. <laughs> That's because you already tell us everything. <laughs> Who knows? Um, let's have a quick look through some of the stuff. Uh, so somebody says, uh, I think the Blender and Houdini can be awesome. I'm honestly just waiting for the perfect moment, uh, the perfect job to really dive into Houdini. I've used it a little bit and I think it's really cool. And the way it does things is incredibly powerful. Um, but for simple tasks, I still think it's easier to use a more traditional 3D package with like basic, you know, the normal tools that you're used to. But for creating just like crazy, abstract, insane stuff, um, Houdini is definitely on the docket, hopefully. So, all right. Is there. Okay. Let's see. Specific, specific add on. That's I have a specific add on. Um, I'd probably recommend a few of them, I guess. Um, so the first one is the, the Manuel Bastioni lab that I showed earlier for creating the people that I use uh, I use quite a lot. Um, then animation nodes, I don't know if people here have heard of it. Animation nodes is, I like to think of it as like the love child of Espresso and Houdini within Blender. So what it allows you to do is it allows you to do a, a node-based sort of workflow. And I don't know why the node isn't showing up. But um, it allows you to do sort of a node-based workflow within Blender. So you can do the same kind of things with building arrays with nodes and doing motion graphics type stuff. So it's, uh, it's kind of interesting. How does Houdini work compared with Blender? Um, yeah, Houdini is just very node-based. It's 
it's getting more and more traditional sort of 3D tools, but um, it started out as a VFX package. So it's extremely good at complex simulations and putting everything together and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I, I see um, your your screen share. Maybe you can uh, disable mm -hmm. it and uh, go back. Uh. Okay. Uh, uh, screen share. share. Stop sharing. Yeah. Cool. Uh, there is one question about the um, Blender stability. Oh yeah. Does my Blender crash a lot? Um, I don't think more or less than other applications. But from my experience with 3ds Max, and I'm not like trying to harp on 3ds Max at all because it's a great application and, and I really enjoyed using it when I did. But I feel when Blender crashes, it's a it's more clear to me why. Like I I've noticed that you know if if I go too far in the subdivisions, then yeah, I know you know I know what I did wrong to make it crash a little bit more clearly than than from what I remember of 3ds Max at least. And there's quirks here and there, but in general, it's incre incredibly stable for me. Um, and the great thing is the autosave system is really good. It autosaves by default every two minutes, so it's really hard to actually lose work. And um, the normal behavior is that when you save a blend file, it automatically backs up the previous version that was there. So you always have the current version and the previous version. So even if something goes corrupt or something goes wrong, um, not that I've had it, but just in case, um, it's actually very well, uh, very well structured. So, so. you other question: uh, What's your plan for the future, and uh, will you release some uh, sci-fi uh, short movie? <laughs> um, I've, I've been working on a, a short film project for a number of years now with a friend and my brother, um, which is still going, but it's very slow because we're all doing it in our free time, and it's not really at a, at a stage anywhere where I could even show something. Um, we're still very conceptual, but that would be, for me, the dream would to be to do a full short film. Um, yeah, so a lot of sci-fi, motion graphics and stuff. Um, and then, but it really depends. Uh, I should be doing the, the titles again for the Digital Art Conference in Frankfurt, and I'll be speaking there in, in October as well. So if there's people from Germany or from that area, um, you know, try and try and get in on it. It's called the yeah, it's just called the Digital Art Conference Frankfurt, and uh, it was first time around was last year, so this will be the second time. I did the titles last year, and um, I was lucky enough to to win a prize uh, with them. And then this year, I'm going to try and do them again, probably together with my brother. Uh, we're going to really try and push it and see how far we can go. And then for the future, I hope to someday open a school. <laughs> Um, but I don't know how, how close or how far that is. I have worked uh, in a school in the past and I really enjoyed that and I really enjoyed teaching. But for now, the freelancing is going really well. So I'm going to do that for another while and, you know, save up some money to do something bigger. I guess that's, that's the main, uh, main thing. Uh, we have another question, uh, two other questions. One uh, sounds obvious, like, uh, do, you, do you play guitar? And uh, another question is, uh, is there anything new in Blender that you are excited about? Okay. Um, so yeah, probably people noticed the guitars here behind me. Um, I used to play guitar a lot more than I do now. I still make music, but mostly digitally. But every now and again, I'll, uh, I'll have some fun and play some crappy guitar because I, I was never really good. <laughs> Um, but I do enjoy it every now and then, uh, but it's more far and few between. I'm too obsessed with the, the whole computer thing <laughs> for the most part. But I used to play in a band and stuff. That's a long time ago. But for some projects, I'll try and do some music because um, I, I, like, I have two brothers that are, that are younger than me, but one of them is also a motion designer and visual effects artist, and the other is a musician. So our dream is to eventually all work together. Um, but yeah. Uh, and then Blender stuff that I'm excited about, a lot, honestly. I think the new Blender version is going to be seriously kick-ass. Um, they're updating a lot of stuff that um, isn't necessarily bad in this version, but when you see the difference uh, in what it's going to be like, it looks like 
it's going to be a lot more accessible, I think, to people. Um, this is going to be all around. I'm just really, really excited for the new version. And the moment everything is implemented that I use a lot, I'm definitely going to switch over, um, no matter how experimental and crazy it might be. But um, most of the things, I'm always really excited about the rendering things. EV, obviously, there's a lot of hype around it, but um, it's, you know, it, it is a real-time render engine. So there's always going to be some limitations, but it's going to be fun exploring those and seeing how to get around them, I think. So I'm more excited for that than the existence of it itself, more uh, just to kind of look at it and see what I can use it for within my workflow. And then generally, um, be hyped about like the boring workflow collection system. I'm all in like up stuff, so I might not be the right person to ask. <laughs> in like obscure cycles, rendering. I've been using Blender for like their <laughs> features and things like that. Uh, yeah. Like ten years. Uh, that was a few questions back. Just excited for the project going yeah. to be a part of it. Now. A lot of those workflows sort of thing. I. <laughs> Uh, as the community and how they approach it and how it does things, you know, and, and, and to kind of see that, uh, if I'm honest, so new school Blender guy, a um, bit of a excited about Blender itself as the community, uh, if I'm honest, so a bit of a... That, that's going to be uh, because uh, we can do it like all the night. Yeah, yeah otherwise we're just going to keep going. going. <laughs> Uh, so, will you talk at Blender conference and will you stream again? And the crowd render, you are in latest question is uh, crowd render, you are in I know, uh, into it. And uh, it. So, um, will I speak at the Blender conference? That's obviously up to the people over at Blender. I will do a submission because um, I really enjoyed speaking there last year. Um, so hopefully, yes, but I can't promise that because it's up to them. But um, if I can make my talk interesting enough, I think there's a pretty good chance that I can be there. Um, and what was the other question? Oh, will I stream more? Yes, I'm going to try and stream as much as I can. Uh, sometimes you'll get like two streams in two weeks, but sometimes there might be a month or even two months between them, um, depending on how busy I get. So, but I, I will keep making content as much as I can. Um, and I have a... a uh, what you would call it, um, sort of a tutorial series called Weird Shit. And it's all about just doing stuff in Blender that you're not supposed to do and getting cool stuff from it. And I am planning on moving that forward. I haven't done episodes in a while, but um, yeah, definitely uh, can do that. And I completely blanked on the very last part of that question. Oh, crowd render. So yeah, crowd render is an add-on being developed by a number of guys in Australia. I've been, been on like the alpha beta team for a while now. It's really cool. It's a plugin that easily allows you to get every CPU and GPU in your house and get it to render on uh, your one computer. So it works really well at the moment. They, they had a crowdfunding campaign that unfortunately didn't go too well, but they still plan on developing it. Um, I'm, I'm only testing it or anything, but uh, when everything works, it seems like I'm one of the people they, uh, they send it to to break it. Um, because I usually make scenes that tend to break stuff that needs to transfer data and files because I, I, I just kind of do my thing. <laughs> so I hope, I hope they... But it's a cool project. That, um, it's cool to see that you can not only grab all your computers from all around, but then you can add Amazon AWS nodes okay, with, it, with them uh, into it, and you'll be able to... I think um, my dream, I've used it on a job once or twice, and it's really cool to be able to grab your laptop go over there and then I use a VPN to uh, connect my computer here at home with my computer at the, the studio that I'm working in. And then I can use the render power of this computer and even both the computers here in my office. That was really just on my laptop. The production quality of a client, I can work there and I can, shouldn't be used for anything else than modeling my laptop, which is way too old. That's what I find at this point. So I want to try it out. And it's free right now. Tell people to check it out. Uh, it's still in an alpha stage, but it, it works quite well already. So. Thank you guys for watching the live and uh, it was a pretty great moment. The thing is, if you want a uh, description, you can try Blender and I think you will, I think you will find great resource. Uh, be sure to follow also um, uh, the Mantisa on Instagram <laughs> and uh, of course BNs and uh, all kind of social medias because the work is uh, really nice. Thanks for... Thank 
being an, an awesome community. Probably see you next time for new uh, new videos, maybe tips, maybe cri cri critique my works and. Uh, cool. Yeah, you I'm guys. happy to do more of that if you're interested. So, and I I want to thank all, everybody that watched the stream as well. Um, thank you <laughs> for uh, for bringing. It's been awesome, and thank you as well. So, so goodbye. Bye, Bye everybody. everybody.